Hello, um, <clears throat> I'm Ismet Persik, and uh, my book fell down. Um, <laughs> but I'm nervous. I take my gum and I put it on my in between my fingers. Um, I'm going to read um, a portion of an uh, uh, early chapter called Some Early Sorrows. The book is about the, uh, growing up in Bosnia during the war, but this is a little uh, kind of um, summary of a life before high school. So this is age 12. In elementary school, I was into math. I liked that there was only one solution per problem, that nothing was vague, and that you didn't have to interpret what the author meant by this or that. I had it all figured out for the first four years. It was later, as the math got more abstract and elusive, and you had to remember formulas and draw coordinate systems and such, that I developed animosity towards the subject. Suddenly, there was more than one solution to a single problem, and I started to lose my footing in reality as I knew it. I remember being obsessed with the notion that a straight line can go on forever and never touch another straight line that was parallel to it. That, seen from the side, a straight line is just a dot, which I thought could not be proven since the line would go right through your eye and brain, rendering you blind and dead. <laughs> Tragically, I said this out loud in class, and my comrade teacher thought I was trying to be funny and made me stand in a corner facing the wall for hours. My peers snickered at the size of my ass, and I visualized myself turning into a dust moat and wa wafting out through the crack under the door. But mostly my change of heart came when she walked into my life, my comrade teacher, Radmila. She was a plump brunette in, in her 40s with pleasant features and nicely manicured nails, but with some kind of a growth on her cheek that allowed her to smile only with one side of her mouth, making the effort seem cold and half-hearted. She was capable of such astonishing mercilessness that I pissed myself 20 minutes into a class because she wouldn't let me out because that's why we have breaks between classes. I sat there in lukewarm dampness inside an acrid cloud thinking of comic book heroes. I stopped doing my homework. I convinced myself I couldn't get it. I faked being sick to cut class. I prayed not to be called on. I copied in other students' work. By the third trimester, I had accumulated a plethora of bad grades, got caught cheating on an exam, little pieces of paper with formulas glued to the underside of my fat ruler, and was sent to the principal's office. The principal, who we called Rooster, because he had a piece of loose, leathery skin co connecting the tip of his chin to the center of his collarbone, ripped me a new one, and then gave me a second chance. If I did well on my final exam, he was going to let, me, uh, let my conduct on becoming a student slide. There was no way I could have pre prepared um, a school year's worth of math in two and a half weeks. I told myself that I was trying. In reality, most of my energy was directed at conjuring up an elaborate scheme that would excuse me from taking the final. I fantasized about being hit by a car and lingering between life and death. I prayed for a communicable disease. It just so happened that my mother had to go with her nurses club to a symposium on how to battle alcoholism somewhere in Macedonia right about the time I was to take my final exam, knowing this ahead of time and realizing that I was going to be alone with my pushover of a father. I hatched my master plan. See, a couple of years back, my cousin Adi had an inflamed appendix that needed to be taken out. Due to the operation and some complications, he didn't have to take any final exams and still passed into the next year. My plan was to find out from him all the symptoms of an appendix attack and act them out for my father in hopes it would get me under the surgical knife. In the dictionary, it said that the appendix is a slender, closed tube attached to large intestine near the point at which it joins the small intestine. I had no problem sacrificing that. <laughs> Not only did my father buy into my performance, but so did the doctors at the ER. I went, out, um, I went out of my way not to blurt out the lists of symptoms like an amateur. I just picked a few good ones and mentioned them offhandedly. There was no empty doubling over or cries of pain. I kept my cool. It worked. By the time they got me into one of those surgery slip-ons and led me down the tiled floors of pacifying mint, green, and bleach, I did get cold feet, but it was too late. The anesthesiologist started telling me a joke and zonked me out just before the punchline. When I tell this story, I often exaggerate and say that my last thought as I was going under was motherfucker, like I said in exaggeration. I dreamt that my inflatable raft got ruptured on some craggy rocks just under the surface and that I was about to sink into the depths where some dark shapes were sliding around. 
I came to in a corridor with terrible pain and a confusion of squeaky wheels and people talking and bleach and iodine. I was wheeled into a room, moved to a bed, and the boy next to me had some complications, so they left him open with a tube dripping yellow pus into a plastic container. He looked miserable. The girl on the other side of me, well, uh, out of, the girl on the other side of my bed was bald. She had lice, among other things. I remember the ravenous sounds my stomach made when they brought in food for everyone but me and the pus boy. I remember his haircut, a little like Hitler's, and the way the liquid glucose dripped down the tube and into my vein for lunch. My mom returned from Macedonia early and pulled some nurse drinks to come and visit me beyond visitation hours. She seemed to have brought, bought my performance as well. She was there when my doctor came into the room looking more like a butcher than a doctor, with an oily skin a sheen, an unshaven neck, and a mustache as solid as a chocolate log. He told us that I was a very lucky boy, that if I hadn't gotten to the hospital when I did, I would have died, that the inflammation of the appendix was at such a late stage that it was full of pus and ready to burst. He then produced a jar of yellowish liquid with what looked like a fat piece of decomposing red licorice, twisted and curled. The biggest one I ever seen, he said. That's including grown-ups. Let me get one thing across. I never, not for a single second during my performance, felt any pain. None. So what happened? Here are some possibilities. Perhaps the doctor found a perfectly normal appendix and realized I was lying and decided to play a little joke on me. Or perhaps I got so far into the role of a boy uh, who's having an appendix attack that I psychosomatically caused my appendix to inflame. <laughs> or maybe God found a twisted way to tell me I needed an operation when my body refused to warn me in the usual way. So what happened? A realization. There's no one solution. Everything is up for interpretation. It's all about what the author meant by this or that. My mom made me go to school after missing only six days. I took the final exam, got a C. Thank you. <laughs>